because I am really very happy. And I hope that I can share this happiness with you because of this first lecture, public lecture, of our Co of Tarsus and Spiritus Society. And uh, I'm also happy because today we are taking a journey together. Okay? A journey that will be guided, uh, in which we will be guided by our dearest Co of Tarsus. So let's begin. Okay, just to remember, nobody knows. Our name is Paul of Tarsus Spiritual Society. And yes, we have a mission. And our mission is the spread of spiritism, as codified by Allan Kardec, together with the teachings of Jesus. And we choose our goal. Our goal is the development of our consciousness as immortal spirits, as human beings our inner transformation that we need so much. And um, someone, someone may be asking, why this name? And we could say that Paul of Tarsus. Paul of Tarsus is first our tribute to this high benevolent spirit, this high missionary of our Christianity. And also it is uh, an inspirational call to all of us. Because Paul of Tarsus, this man, he had his life dramatically changed after that divine encounter on the way to Damascus. And after that, he, um, his life was dedicated entirely to the spread of the message of Jesus, this message of love, and also about the truth, about the one and only God. And uh, Paul went beyond the borders of his home Judea, but he also went beyond the borders, chiefly, of his own personal history. And uh, he went far away. He went far to those that were the pagan people of those times. And they were called the Gentiles. And they were not Jewish law obeying people. Okay? And he founded among them the first Christian churches. And he nourished those churches with repeated visits, with repeated letters. But those were not churches in the sense that we know today. Um, imponent temples, uh, numerous congregations, no. Those were really very tiny, small groups sometimes. Those were called the house churches. And um, Paul traveled. Oh, how Paul traveled. He traveled a lot. Do you think is there anything different from our times today? Yeah, different? Yes. Yeah, Paul had no planes. You can imagine that. He couldn't have reserved tickets. <laughs> GPS? Not even think. But he had a very precise compass within his heart which were the message of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus. And he was willing to share that message, that uh, certainty about the one and only God with all those peoples that he visited. And um, he went far, he traveled a lot. He traveled. And when we talk about spreading of ideas, because it was this that Paul was doing, dissemination of new ideas, we can't help thinking about going to different places, about talking to people, 
about telling them uh, about what we think would be a valued point for everybody to consider in the quest for happiness. Because ultimately, the quest for happiness is the ultimate goal for all, all our searches, from all of us. And yes, Paul traveled a lot to spread the message of Jesus. And he founded the first Christian churches in places such as Ephesus, Corinth, Athens, and many others, Thessalonica, Philippi, Colossae, and um, Galatia. After those visits, Paul wrote letters to those communities, to those friends, we can say that they become friends, they became friends. And those letters are the famous 13 letters that compound the 27 books of the New Testament. A great part, yes? Although it's not within the scope of our talking today, um, extended comments about those travels, uh, I found a very instructive video. And I think you both will like a lot. Okay? Um, and this video helps us to cover the thousands of miles of Paul's missionary trips. So, if anyone here is afraid of small planes, <laughs> I can do anything because we are boarding just now. Okay? All aboard? All aboard? Yes? Paul went on three big trips. The first was around 46 AD. Look, we're drawing a line. Starting in Antioch, Paul sailed to the island of Cyprus, then sailed up to Asia Minor and visited the city of Perga, another city called Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derby. Then he did the whole thing backwards. Lystra, Iconium, the other Antioch, Perga, then Atalaya, then sailed all the way back to Antioch, 1,400 miles. He must have used a lot of gas. But no, he was either in a boat or walking the whole way. I bet those Roman roads came in, Andy. They sure did. His next trip was much further. Around 49 AD, he walked to Tarsus, then Cilicia, Derby, Lystra, Iconium, Phrygia, that sounds cold. I don't think it was. Then up to an area called Galatia, and all the way over to another called Mysia, then Troas, and then he visited Samothrace, Neapolis, Philippi, Amphipolis, Apollonia, Thessalonica, Berea, then all the way down to Athens, which is the center of Greek culture, then over to Corinth, where he stayed for a year and a half, then Sankri, then back on our boat and all the way over to Ephesus, then all the way down back across the Mediterranean, all the way to Caesarea. Whoa, what a long trip. And then to Jerusalem, 2,800 miles. He must have worn out his sneakers. I think he wore out several pair of sneakers. And finally, a few years later, around 52 AD, he went on his third big trip. From Antioch, he walked all the way up through Galatia. That would make your feet sore. Then to Phrygia, then on to Ephesus, where he stayed for three years. That's a long time. Then all the way up to an area called Macedonia. Macedonia, I like that name. And back on another boat, all the way down to Corinth, then all the way back up to Macedonia. Again? Yep, again. And then on another boat over to Troas, Assos, Mytilene, Chios, Samos, Miletus, Kos, down to Rhodes over to Patera, then once again back across the Mediterranean Sea all the way to Tyre, and down to Ptolemaeus, Caesarea, and finally back to Jerusalem again, another 2,700 miles. That's a lot of traveling. It sure is. It's like crossing America from one end to the other three and a half times and without cars or trains or planes, just as two feet and a boat here and there. 
Well, along all those comings and goings, um, we could say that a new man, or better say, a new soul, was being forged. And many now have heard about Jesus, about the only God. And many people were searching for gods, new gods, at that time. That time was the post-Olympian times. And they were not satisfied, the pagan people, with their gods. And they were even searching for gods internationally. So Paul was a very good news for them. Yeah. And um, the Yale University, they have courses in their YouTube channel. One of those courses is the um, New Testament, about New Testament, history and literature. It's not a religious course. And Professor Dale, uh, he comments that the scholars, the philosophers, even secular or religious ones, they have written a great amount of works about Paul, addressing Paul, this uh, missionary of the first Christianity, of the early Christianity. And of course, the scholars disagree uh, in their considerations. Uh, what is a historic, a historical source of value or not? So, <clears throat> Among all those letters that came to us from Paul, uh, the scholars consider, um, among them, that seven they consider undisputed. That means all of them, they agree that some man wrote them, or just one man, and he called himself Paul. The other letters, uh, some scholars say they are Paul's, some scholars say they are not. Some say some disciples wrote, even decades later in the first century. For us, in our study, what really counts is the spiritual message and also the objective. Because with those letters, who um, addressed many issues he tried to give some coherence to those house churches. Cohesion. He tried to give them incentive. He tried to address disagreements among the members. Okay? And most importantly, uh, they were very crucial for the understanding of the new ideas that he was bringing to them. And because some of those people, some of them were already learned somehow about the spiritual subjects. But the others were really beginners. Okay? And what is most important is that Paul, with those letters, he wanted to reinforce the fraternal bonds of of fraternal love. Because Paul knew that the hard bonds are really the ones that can last. That's an important point for us to remember. And about Paul's biography, we can say that in the books, most that we can find in the books comes from the tales get from the Acts of Apostles about Paul's biography. And uh, some scholars doubt even the historicity of Acts of Apostles. So that professor at Yale University, even uh, that course was not a religious one, and he um, told his students, well, if they doubt the historicity, what can we do? Okay, let's ask Paul. Let's ask what Paul tells about himself in the letters. And then he did this task with the students. And I found it very interesting because 
um, the details in acts and in the letters. For me, I'm not a scholar, but for me, there are more, more, more uh, difference of details, not so many discrepancies. Okay? So I decided to put up the chart here with the two columns, because it's, I found it very interesting. And what Acts tells about Paul? Acts tells that Paul was brought up and educated in Jerusalem at the feet of Gamaliel. His original name was Saul, born a Roman citizen, he speaks Hebrew fluently, and Acts, they pictures uh, a way of Paul acting in the communities that he visited in a kind of pattern. He would go first to the synagogue. After rejected, he would go to the Gentiles. In the letters, we don't find this pattern. Okay, it's different. What Paul tells about himself in the text of the letters is that he is from the tribe of Benjamin, a Pharisee, persecutor of the church before he became a follower of Jesus, a Jew zealous of the law, righteous under the law. He preached circumcision at one time before, and he was a manual laborer. Well, uh, why am I bringing you all this information here today? Yeah? Why? Okay? Uh, we don't have to become scholars. That's true. And we can't know everything. Another thing that is also true. Okay? But, however, the more information we can collect about Paul, about his world, about his time, the more we can understand his acts and his teachings. And also, we can't forget what Kardec told us. That if we, we can never abandon our critic sense, if we are to build up a strong faith. Okay? On the other hand, there's another important thing for us to collect more information about the subjects we study. If we get uh, more informed about Paul, about his world, about his time, about what historians, what critics say, what the biblical texts say, what happens is that we will have more clarity for agreeing or not with all these informations and also with all the information we can find in the mediumship books that we have in Spiritus. Yes, we have to be informed, to agree or not. It's our task. And we do have books about Paul. Okay, mediumship books. Paul, uh, books written about Paul in the Spiritus movement. And Emmanuel, uh, I hope everyone here knows who Emmanuel is, yes? So Emmanuel, this benevolent spirit, he wrote hundreds of books by the mediumship of, of Chico Xavier in Brazil, okay? And one of them, Paul and Stephen. Yes, it is about Paul. It is about Paul, and it, it is um, very uh, of undeniable value because it has um, a richness of details that help us to fill the gaps that we find in Acts. Okay? Because in Acts, uh, the information is scattered. There are some uh, points missing. And many of those missing pieces we can find in Paul and Stephen. So it helps us in our understanding of Paul and his teachings. For instance, Paul and Stephen helps us to precise this age and the time of Paul. So uh, the book. Uh, tells us that Paul was a contemporary of Jesus and that he had lived very near all those facts. A 
was not distanced from those facts. And Arundo Dutra Dias, this active disseminator of spiritism and the gospel in Brazil and abroad, he is also a writer, he is the author of the translation of the New Testament from the Greek originals directly to Portuguese, which we didn't have before in Brazil. For us, it's very important. Well, Aroldo presented many lectures, many seminars about Paul. He loves Paul. He told this. I'm not inventing. He told that he loves Paul. It's a kind of love. And he presented many studies, many seminars. And from the spiritist point of view, of course. Okay? And he based it mostly in Emmanuel's books. And of course, in all his knowledge. Because he knows Hebrew, he knows Greek, Aramaic, and he is very uh, learned about New and Old Testament. And I, I, I consider him a scholar, okay? I myself. And I, I learn a lot with Arodo. Well, Arodo proposes to look at Paul from a different approach, okay? From one that considers the journey of the spirit Paul, okay? that considers his mission as part of a broader divine program that is important not only for the spirit pool, but for all humanity. Okay? So uh, this approach can bring us lessons because we are also immortal spirits, just like Paul. We can learn with him. Yeah? And, and here, I would say that we could add a third question to those two questions that Professor Dale Martin proposed in his course. And we could ask what Emmanuel tells us about Paul. So we can complete our information. Okay? And the richness of information is so that today we are going to frame three aspects. Okay? Three aspects that are very important for us uh, to fulfill the mission that we saw in the beginning, for us in our search for inner transformation, okay? which is the main purpose, the main goal of our studies, of our reflections, of our prayers. Okay? So, but before beginning to uh, highlighting those three aspects, we should first uh, think that we live here in the 21st century. Why Paul? Paul lived back there in Judea more than 2,000 years ago. So when we read this book, and I really recommend the read the re reading of the book, um, we have to go beyond the surface of the facts, of the characters, characters, so we can find the unique aspects that can help us bring the world of Paul to our world of today. Okay? That can help us to find parallels, connections, so we can really learn with this study. Well, the first aspect that we could highlight is that Paul is a complex and profound personality. Okay? He was intelligent, he was a loving man, and at the same time a passionate one, ardent person. There were no in-betweens for Paul. He was so intense in everything, in the way he behaved, in the way he expressed himself, his ideas, in the way he expressed his wills, and those traits we can find in that, in the letters, and also in Poet Stephen, those traits. And a second aspect that Emmanuel portrays uh, in the very beginning of his book is that Paul was a man of three worlds, at least. Okay. 
And what is interesting is that many years later, um, a very uh, important, a leading British New Testament scholar, uh, Nicholas Thomas Wright, in line with Emmanuel, he said the same thing. He said that Paul was capable of dialoguing with the three worlds of the first century. Jerusalem, Greece, and Rome. Okay. Paul was then, we can say, the maximum of universality. This one, very important aspect. And what is important for us? observing the aspect is that Paul uses all his competences in the service to serve his spiritual works. That's a very good tip for us. As so, as a Pharisee, he was intense in his work. After Damascus, he also intensely was um, working to spread the news about Jesus, about the only God. So, this universality is present in the texts of Acts of Apostles. For example, when Paul uh, was arrested by the Roman centurion and he arrives at the, door of the, the doors of the temple, he addresses the priestess in Hebrew. When he was finally arrested, because he was arrested many times, his, his life was a, a very, you could say the least, active one. Okay? In his last arrest, when he uh, perceived that they were manipulating to condemn him, he evokes his Roman citizen. And when he went to Greece, talking to the Greek men in the Areopagus. Uh, he addressed those men and quoting Greek philosophers, Greek poets, and Greek traditions. Okay? So, what comes for us is that Paul mastered not only the, the language, the language, the different languages, he mastered the way of thinking of the different people too. And he mastered the patterns of thinking of Greek so he could use the rhetoric techniques of presenting and refuting ideas to make himself understood by different people. Okay? To express his most profound reflections. Okay? To convey uh, with purity the essence of the message he wanted to pass them, which was the message of Jesus. And uh, a message that was a message of freedom, but a freedom with commitment. Okay? Freedom with commitment with the highest ethical and moral principles. So he could do that. So uh, Paul surpasses all the limits, the linguistic limits, the cultural, the customs limits, and therefore we need to look at him from different angles if we are to grasp his grandiosity. Okay? And the third aspect that we can highlight is the cultural competence. Well, the ones here who struggle with the professional environment know this expression, okay? Working effectively, cross-culturally. If Paul were here with his curriculum under his arms, he would be considered by the employers a very up-to-date candidate. Because Paul, Paul knew how to dialogue with the diversity. And if, with the different levels of diversity. And what is most important? Without confrontations. Okay? Well, now let's bring our reflections to Spiritism. Okay? And we could say that Spiritism is also very up to date. 
Why? Because the spiritists may be dressed in a Belle Epoque outfit. But it's very up to date because it tells us that we need uh, to, um, how could I say, to switch over between religious, scientific, and philosophical fields if we are to evolve thoroughly. Spiritism tells us that we need to change in the lenses from matter to spirit if we want to understand life better. Okay? So, we could say that spiritism is very important for us to develop our cultural competence. Okay? And it helps us way better because the Spiritism helps us to develop our cultural competence beyond the limits of this material life. And as we are spirits, I am. Are you? In my passport is written, Vandal C. Spirit. Okay? And in yours too. So we need to develop this cultural competence that transcends our material life. the Galatians, he confessed, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. What cost us Paul came to this point? What changed the old soul to the new Paul? Well, say that life had some difficult detours for Paul, as it has for us too. Okay? Variables were presented to be chosen using his free will, uh, conquering, transcending the inner barriers of pride. Does that also happen to us? No. No, we don't need that. Oh, hey, we are high spirits. Yes. Yes, do we always choose right? Oh, okay. Neither did Paul all the time. Okay? Neither did Paul all the time. And um, we have Emmanuel to help us. Emmanuel, in this book, Venus de Luz, we don't have the translation into English yet. We will have certainly, okay? They are translating all Emmanuel's books. Emmanuel tells us, each human existence is based on precious calculations of probability. Okay? Again, Haroldo Dutra commenting this lesson by Emmanuel, he told us a very interesting reflection. I like that very much. He says that life offers ways for us to choose. Yeah. But life's ways, they are not straightforward ways. No, never. They are never straightforward ways. Life's ways, they form a kind of a web. Okay? And there were where there are plenty of doors. Okay? So even if we choose a wrong door, we will find ways to another door, and to a second one, and to another door, another and another and another, as long as we need, okay? We can reach the same point from a million different ways. And that means there is not only one way for us to travel from inferior to superior, from shadows to light. Here, our relative perfection, the happiness that we are all destined to. Okay? <coughs> and I found this reflection very instructive and very beautiful one. Okay, very made, makes it very clear for us. And what made Paul change from the persecutor 
to the responsible father, amorous father, to all those early Christians, was Van Dor. He <coughs> chose Van Dor. But what he didn't knew, that when he, he, he would open that door, he would have a divine surprise behind it. Okay? And it helps to us too. Okay? So, I found a very good adaptation of this excerpt of uh, the Acts on the way to Damascus. A very honest one. So I brought here for us, so we can remember it, okay? Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Who art thou, Lord? I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Arise. And go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Ananias. Behold, I am here, Lord. Arise, and go into the street which is called Straight and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. And he hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in, and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Lord, I have heard by many of this man, how much evil he hath done to thy saints in Jerusalem. And here, here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will shew him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Brother Saul, receive thy sight.
the God determines in the inner of our soul what is better for us. And the greatest challenge for our evolution is to be able to understand this will about us. Is to develop this spirit of awareness that, uh, that so we can listen to this voice telling us this way, not that way. Okay? And after Damascus, Paul was a hundred percent connected with the Christ. So, he knew the purpose for his life then. What is the purpose for our lives? For my life? Do I have the, the, the right answer now? Do I have the right answer now? Well, we can only have the right answer if we are totally connected with this broadband internet of the superior energy that rules the universe. And we could say that um, the religious aspect to spiritism is this question that we have to propose to ourselves every day of our life. Which is my level of intimacy with God? Okay? So I can understand His ways for me. So I can understand the experiences that I, I have in my life as the best I could have. So this is the supreme challenge for us here on earth. To develop this confidence despite what is happening in our life. But sometimes life sometimes makes us cry in order to make us see. Huh? But we, we need to, to do our best to come to the point that one day we can paraphrase Paul and ask, as Paul did, Oh Lord, oh supreme force of the universe, that rules my life, that guides my life. What is it you want me to do? And we will have the right answer. So to conclude this talking today, shall we ask again, what brought Paul, the apostle, to the real life? To know the purpose of his life on earth? The only and perfect A plus answer would be love. Because Jesus flooded Paul with his infinite love. And this love, impregnated in his soul, came to us until today. And uh, in the lines, those sublime lines that Paul wrote. To the Corinth, to the Corinth, for example, and that we, um, oops, sorry, that we partially included in our logo at Old Tarsus. Okay. okay, I think we finished with our reflections about Paul, but I. We will take advantage of this atmosphere here, okay? And I will invite all of us for some moments of vibration. Let's close our eyes and let's vibrate love. Let's imagine love as a bright light coming out of our chest. A light that fills this room and expands beyond it and involves all places and people who you want to rescue from the shadows. From the shadows of solitude, 
from the shadows of abandonment, disagreements, anger, and despair, from the sufferings of all kinds, from the sufferings that come from the soul and the sufferings that come from our bodies. And let us thank the high spirits who make possible today this symphony of love under the command of Jesus, who oversees our life in this planet, in the name of God. And let's hear Paul. Speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have no love. I'm nothing more than a cracked trumpet a bit of struck metal. I may be able to prophesy, to understand mysteries, to have immense knowledge of all things, able to move mountains even. But if I don't have love, I have nothing. I may sell all my property to feed the poor. I may submit to execution, burning, martyrdom. But if I have no love, it means nothing at all. Let me tell you what love is like. It's ready to suffer. There's no envy in it. It isn't puffed up. Never unseemly, never selfish. Thinks no evil. Isn't easily provoked. Love never fails. But not in the way that words fail, or prophecies fail, or even knowledge fails. We know a little, prophesy a little. But when the perfect thing comes, love personified in Jesus, we don't need even that little. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. So the business of knowing more goes on. Now, we see by a mirror darkly. One day, we shall see reality face to face. Now I, I know in part, someday, I shall know, even as I am known. And all this will come about through the power of love. There are three things that truly last, faith, hope, 